this is Wayland Smithy, and we know today that it's a burial mound. But in the 17th century, we had John Aubrey here, and he was one of the first gentleman antiquarians, the precursors of archaeologists. And he thought that it was just a natural cave because, well, it didn't look like it does today. It was a bit run down and tumbled down. There have been two excavations here. The first one was in 1919, so just after the First World War. And it was a bit of a mess. It was a bit, you know, it's very poorly recorded. But what they did do is find this burial chamber. I'm going to be getting in there with Hugh and going around the track in the jog cart with my lovely Jazz. And I'm going to have my first go at trotting. Are you ready? Go get it. Off we go. Hey. It may look like a gentle start, but I'm holding on for dear life. <laughs> Sorry, I've got my hand That's on your right, leg. <laughs> That's all right. You, you hang on whatever you can hang on, OK? You might regret saying that. <laughs> He was suggested a race against the clock. OK, I'm going to time you this. I'm, I'm going to time you this lap now, OK? We'll go past the gate there. You can't get Go on, then, Jazz. Can you see what the time was on there? Let's see. One, what was that? 1.32? Oh, there we go. So you went much I beat, my, I beat my record. You went much, you went much faster. Woo! So the great thing about Birch Park is it should, well, it should, peel back really easily and I've tried to cut it into a nice little sheet here. You see? Isn't that great? Because what we're going to be doing is we're going to try and make some birch bark tar which has been found in a lot of archaeological sites. Archaeologists do these kind of experiments to, to learn more about how people did things in the past to kind of get to grips with techniques and really physically get to the idea of how, how things were done in the past. This is a strenuous walk, 20 miles longer than the Pennine Way, at 275 miles long. And the total amount of uphill walking that you do adds up to 60,500 feet. That's more than twice the height of Mount Everest. It's such an evocative place. You can really understand why people come here, why Phil came here and stayed here. It's like a little oasis of peace in a busy world. When they got to about here, they had a surprise because they found that there was an earlier oval barrow and the long barrow had been built over it. And when they dug down, they found a wooden platform and 14 bodies. And the really interesting thing is that they came back and they re-examined the radiocarbon dates recently. And you can be quite precise nowadays with radiocarbon dates. And they found that there's only 150 years over the entire use of this site and only 50 years between the end of the early stage site and this one being built. This is the great hall of the manor house that was built when the abbey fell. It was created out of the domestic buildings. And it's difficult to imagine today, but it was only 100 years ago that there were 12 families living together here. But look over here. There's a circular earthen bank and it runs the whole length of the field. Now this is the original course of the river and it's right next to the abbey. This is an incredibly steep slope here. And I just I thought I'd have a little dig around with the trowel and in two minutes I've already found a load of pottery sheds, some loose stones, and all of this dark earth. And what I think has been happening is that the manor and the abbey before it have been tossing down their rubbish all the way down this slope here and it's just gathering. And nowadays we can actually dig around and have a look at the remains of their household waste. Do you hear that? We've got three species of woodpecker in Britain, but really the great spotted woodpecker is the only one that's really going to respond to you. He's the only one that's going to fall for this because he's so aggressive, he's the most territorial. This is wood sorrel and it looks a bit like clover, but it tastes really, really citrusy, very tangy. And it should go really, really well with trout if we ever manage to catch any, that is. Well, you take the nice rods and I'm expected to catch something as well. Well, if the fish are hungry, you've got just as much chance as me. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, as they say, it's what you do with it. 
<laughs> really? <laughs> I don't really want to know. This is the life, eh? Not bad, is it? Oh, I think I've got one. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, I have. You have that? not. <laughs> I you did not. Yeah. Yeah. Really got one. It's caught in the bloody river. No, it's not. Look. Are you serious? There's no hook on it. <laughs> Can you know? Mm. It's like elderflower that's, cordial, isn't that's it? That's amazing. It's sort of. I wonder if it intensifies when you're cooking it. It's quite lightly. Really, it's very subtle but delicious. It's really kind of perfumey as well, isn't it? Mm. Cheers to that. No. <laughs> we think we're so modern and all of our treatments are so novel and yet in the past people had the ingenuity to make things like this. I mean this is our birch bark tar and yes it's a preservative and it's an adhesive but it's also a wonderful skin tonic. So look at that. So how's that for a Neolithic spa. You know, it's not just man that can destroy archaeological sites. It's our little furry rabbit friends as well. So thanks, Thumper.